Hello, you made it to my presentation. I'm going to be doing a case study on the invasive crayfish of Lake Tahoe. Um, Okay, so many of you know of Lake Tahoe. It's crystal clear blue waters and it's on the border of California and Nevada. And I would go here every summer um, and camp with my sister. And then I wanna say about a year and a half or so ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, when I was swimming, I saw a crayfish. And I was like, that's weird. I've never seen one of those before. And so that inspired me to do this as my case study to see what was going on here. Um, a little bit about the crayfish. Um, on the bottom is what you usually see it looks like, usually tan brown. Um, but I also thought this crayfish looked cool because it did have like bright red and blue on its claws and legs. Um, and so they're pretty easy to identify. Um, and then a key feature that these have is a smooth carapace. Um, some native crayfish are going to have bumps or ridges on them. So that's how you can tell if you're dealing with a native or an invasive. And before you can decide if it's a native or invasive, you want to know its original range. Um, and so the signal crayfish um, originated in the Columbia River Basin and its tributaries have moved out towards Oregon and Washington. Um, so in this like mustardy yellow color, over here, USGS has mapped the watersheds where the crayfish were originally found. Um, Native Hydrological Unit Code is what HUC stands for. And then in this maroon color, you can see it's moved its way down to Lake Tahoe, along within the Delta and Central California coast. Um, the reason they were introduced um, was to become forage for fish uh, and recreational fishing. Um, some ecology about the crayfish. They usually like to seek shelter in rocky crevices or woody debris. Um, they inhabit both coastal and upland streams, lakes, rivers, um, and they have a really wide range of conditions that they're able to tolerate. Um, they have been found to habitate in clear, shallow coastal streams to major rivers with high turbidity, um, as well as eutrophic and oligotrophic lakes and reservoirs. Um, the crazy thing is that this uh, crayfish is also found in saline waters. Um, and so that's how they're found in the Sacramento Delta. Um, and then one study found that the signal crayfish can occupy waterways with salinity as high as 26 parts uh, per million, which or yeah, 26 precipitate, which comes out to 75% uh, seawater for several days. Um, and so that's just extreme conditions for a crustacean to be living in. Um, and then something that's pretty normal about this one is that the breeding cycle of the signal crayfish follows that of most temperate zone crayfish. Um, this was not one of the organisms we went over in lecture. So I wanted to go over it a little bit in more detail. Um, so what usually happens is copulation occurs during the autumn months in like September and October. The females carry the eggs through the winter and then eggs typically hatch in March and April as the water warms. Um, growth is gonna be temperature dependent though. And so in Lake Tahoe, the water is colder than in other temperate regions. Um, so males may mature during their third summer, while females may not mature until their fourth. Um, and then something else that's interesting is crayfish growth is density dependent. And so they're more likely to go through big rushes of growing and then dying back. Um, and so it's a fast growing species and long lived. It's known to be one of the most or excuse me, it's known as one of the fastest growing species of temperate crayfish. Um, so what's the problem? Um, they have been described as cows of the sea or I guess lake in the system um, where they're grazing algae on the bottom. 
and as they're grazing, you know, they're consuming that and that should make the water clearer at first. But as they process the algae and defecate, those nutrients are being put back into the system and leading to more algae blooms. And so it's almost like a negative feedback loop of decreasing water clarity and increasing algae. Um, and Tahoe is known and famed for its clear blue, clear blue waters. And so there's a high um, profile as far as like tourism industry there. Um, and I found this radio clip of what's going on from NPR in 2012. It's just three minutes, I'll play that. At Lake Tahoe, the tourism industry is a given. Now for the first time since the 1930s, Lake Tahoe is open to commercial fishing. Nevada has given the green light to an entrepreneur to harvest crayfish. Kate McGee of member station KUNR in Reno reports it's a small business venture that could also prove useful to tourism. The sun is still rising over the surrounding mountains as Fred Jackson and his nephew Justin Pulliam pilot their boat out onto Lake Tahoe. They cut bait and they set their traps. Scientists estimate there are around 300 million crayfish in Lake Tahoe. Jackson had the idea to harvest the lobster-like creatures as a small business. Right now, he says, he and his nephew are looking for the best fishing sites through trial and error. As we move along and research tells us where to go, then we'll end up moving to a spot where we're going to hit it really hard. We'll go in, we'll soak the traps for two days, pull them back out, and bring the harvest back in. Jackson is working with a wholesale company, Sierra Gold Seafood, which has around 30 local hotels, casinos, and restaurants interested in buying the crayfish. Sierra Gold expects that number to grow. B. Gorman is the president of the South Lake Tahoe Chamber of Commerce. She says Tahoe crayfish are a new product the chamber can market to tourists as a local food. We don't grow anything up here. You know, it's hard to make a gourmet dish out of um, pine boughs. <laughs> you know, we don't have pine tree oil. We don't have a lot of products. The crayfish are more than a business opportunity. Harvesting them could also improve water clarity near the shore. Tahoe is famous for its clear ice blue water. Its clarity has diminished over time. It's a major concern to state and regional environmental agencies. Dr. Sadiq Chandra, a freshwater biologist at the University of Nevada, Reno, studies crayfish at Lake Tahoe. These crayfish are like cattle in the landscape where they're moving across the bottom of the lake grazing on algae. Algae makes the lake cloudy, so it stands to reason that crayfish would improve lake clarity. But Dr. Chandra says that's not the case. They can graze some algae down, but when they excrete their nutrients, they can stimulate algal production. The crayfish project has received virtually zero criticism from local environmental groups because of its potential to clean the lake. But its impact on lake clarity overall depends on California lawmakers. Two-thirds of Lake Tahoe is in the state of California. The cost of environmental studies and permits has stalled legislation in the California Assembly. 48 hours after setting the traps, Fred Jackson and his nephew are back out on the lake to see what they've caught. Some traps have only a handful of crayfish, but others are full. The crayfish fill an entire bucket. Two men empty the traps and quickly head to shore, but the crayfish will soon be served up at a local casino buffet. For NPR News, I'm Kate McGee in Reno. Um, so that was in 2012 when this interview took place. Um, and of course, some time has passed and some changes have been made since then. At Lake Tahoe, Oops. the tourism industry is a given. Um, and so of the agencies that were invested, UC Davis Tahoe Environment Research Center um, and Q Tahoe Blue, which I'm sure many of you have seen the stickers for, are two of the biggest proponents of keeping water clarity high. Um, the UC Davis group started measuring water clarity in 1968, and the sucky depth was 102 feet deep. In 2000, it was 67. So that is a big decline since then. 
um, this fishing, the crayfish started in 2012. Um, and so there's been a little bit of changes since then. And as the segment said, it's on two states. So there's conflict of who's gonna say what on the borders of the lake. Um, Nevada has opened commercial harvesting of crayfish as of July 2012. Um, supposedly California followed suit in 2013, but permitting hasn't been developed. What I found was that there still is a law that prohibits Californian residents to sell or purchase crayfish taken from the Tahoe or the Tahoe Basin. Um, and is there any controversy? Uh, not really. <laughs> Does everyone agree for the most part? Um, this quote I got on the bottom is from Again, UC Davis and the same more than 80 organizations, including government agencies and research institutions, are working in collaboration to address environmental impacts, excuse me, of Lake Tahoe's fragile ecosystem. Um, and so this is a really cool graph I found um, where they are displaying that sucky depth information. Um, so this right here would be 2012. And shortly after that, we did see it quick decline until like 2015 or so. And then it's been increasing since. The most recent year they have published is gonna be for 2019. Um, important notes was that secchi depth could change um, eight feet to 10 feet a year. And so it decreased eight feet from the previous year's 10 foot improvement. Um, so far the lowest or like, yeah least deep sucky depth was in 2017 at 60 feet. Um, and has it worked? So the fisherman, he used to be a, or it was written, he was a veteran of the fish and game or of the wildlife warden and has now quit that to become a full-time fisherman. And that's his company, um, Tahoe Lobster. Um, Clarity by Cuisine. Supposedly the reviews say that crayfish grown in Lake Tahoe taste cleaner uh, just because it's clean water. Um, and then he has partnered with Sierra Gold Seafood, which also I did find currently they are selling crayfish wholesale. They're not selling it in their market. Um, and so it is being used at local casinos and hotels, um, but it's hard to tie directly if the crayfish being removed has helped the lake directly or if it's just a cofactor, or um, one of many things. Um, so in summary, the cause and solution are known. Um, crayfish were introduced to Marlette Lake, um, which feeds into Lake Tahoe in 1895. And since then, because they are rapid growing and long lived species, they have spread especially because they have such a wide tolerance of environmental states to live in. Um, and the whole reason that there was a ban on recreational fishing was because of the overexploitation and extinction of the Mahontan cutthroat trout. Um, and that was in the 1930s. Um, and so how Jackson was able to get this law in Nevada overturned was he reached out to a limnologist and was like, something's wrong with the water. And him and the limnologist presented their case to court in Nevada saying like, this will be beneficial all around. Like it'll increase tourist income um, by keeping the water clear. It'll have more revenue for the state um, and provide exports um, for crayfish. And so one of the interesting problems was is there gonna be a market for crayfish outside of like just a local cuisine? And what I found was that there is. <laughs> and so they're exporting um, Lake Tahoe crayfish to China, to the UK. Um, the interesting thing is that I found some conflicting information that um, at King's College in London, um, they were doing a study that reported invasive signal crayfish from the US were introduced to England in the 1970s and since then have spread rapidly, um, displacing native crayfish 
impacting fish and damaging ecosystems. Um, there was a movement at the time that UK or your not European, but yeah, UK chefs were encouraging um, residents to trap and collect crayfish to eat them to try to be an effort to clean and prevent more invasive impacts of occurring. But what happened was the traps are too small. Like the holes are not small enough to catch the fish that they were smaller than a pence, which I'm not sure how big a pence is, but um, the efforts to catch them are greater than what it would be to eat them. Um, so there's a little bit of conflicting information on like if it's being exported, is it because they're bigger? Um, because they have an invasive problem and I assume and hope that by the time they get to the UK they are dead. So hopefully there aren't being any released and just pushing the problem elsewhere um, as far as globalization. And California has had a wait and see approach as far as um, lifting restrictions and permitting. Um, it looks like commercial, it might be able to, um, but there, it was a little bit difficult to find. Um, and then this picture in the bottom right is in the year 2014. And so 2014 was when we had the highest or like least sucky depth of like the 60 feet. And there was a big algae bloom in South Lake Tahoe, which is where most of the casinos and the hotels and the tourist industry is. Um, so this was a big impact there. My recommendations are to allow Californians commercial harvest of crayfish as well as recreational. Um, as much of the crayfish as we can get out, it seems like the best idea to prevent the negative feedback loop of nutrient cycling. Um, and also I want to applaud and acknowledge that efforts of Keep Tahoe Blue have been very successful so far. And I just encourage those efforts to continue.